This video was brought to you by the generosity of my supporters on Coffee. Thank you for supporting the channel. Hello, my lovelies. My name's Gilbert Dolphalian, and the plan for today is to talk about quilting and what it's useful for. At its very core, quilting is layers of fabric joined together with stitches, either machine or hand sewn. There's two main uses of this technique either to make a very thick, very warm garment or cover that's also very light, and or to make a highly decorative piece with a 3D effect. It's also historically been combined a lot with patchwork, that is to say lots of little scraps or cabbage of previous projects being sewn to make a greater whole. When we talk about quilting today, we tend to think about either bed covers or perhaps quilted jackets, but historically they were used for a whole range of things, including petticoats and skirts, protective garments, and of course decorative pieces as well. I've linked a couple of examples from the Victoria and Albert down below so you can have a look at the kind of ranges of things that were done. And I know that other museums have similar ranges of examples so you can also have a look at whatever your local it is or maybe some of the others. There is a theory that quilting came to Europe from the Middle East during the Crusades of the 12th century because they were fairly uncommon, but not completely unknown in Europe before that. The gambeson was one of the main uses of quilting here, and the term quilt came to use in the English language in about the 13th century. One of the earliest examples of European quilting that we have is a piece from 14th century Sicily that shows the story of Tristan and Isolde, from the Arthurian legends. Historically, quilts were sewn obviously by hand, sometimes with an embroidery hoop or frame to help tension them. Today you can get specialist electrical equipment to help with them, such as long arm quilting machines, which use a head that does the sewing and tracks and rollers that it moves along, the earliest versions of which were invented in 1871. There are also quilt patterns that you can use to pattern out your pieces if you're doing patchwork, or to pattern out the pattern itself that you're going to sew. But to get started, you don't need anything outside of your project and your normal tools. So if you have those at the ready, let me show you the method. The start of both machine and hand sewing for this technique are the same, so you start out the same no matter how you plan to sew it. As I said earlier, the core of it is layers of fabric. You want a piece for the back, which is called the backing, and a decorative top fabric. Then in between something large and fluffy, so something like wadding, and that's what will give you the 3D effect and keep it lighter, but in principle you can use whatever you like. Ideally use something non-stretch. Quilting is in theory possible in stretch, but you might hate yourself afterwards. I've picked out some fabric for my scrap spin, so I'm gonna use some cotton velvet that I brought ridiculously cheaply to go inside, and then these two pieces for my top and backing. If you're doing a garment you want to do this before you sew the seams together and remember that you will lose a bit of width. More if your pattern is complicated and your inner portion thick so remember to allow for that when you're cutting. At this stage you need to decide if you want to freehand your pattern or pre-plan it. Freehanding is usually used for art pieces and it's where you just sew without having drawn out your pattern beforehand but as a beginner I don't recommend it. You can find plenty of ideas online if you're not sure what you want to do and plenty of patterns have historical bases as well, but curves, especially tight curves like circles, are harder to do by machine so bear that in mind. When you've decided on your pattern, copy it over to your fabric in something washable so you'll be able to follow it. If you're hand sewing, it will need to go on the front. If you're machine sewing, you can do front or back. Then line up your layers and baste or pin them into place. And now the method's split, so let's start out with hand quilting. The advantage of hand sewing is that you have more control over what you're doing. The disadvantage is, as always, time. If you can, and if you have one, load it up into an embroidery hoop or frame to help hold everything taut and in place. Running stitch is the normal stitch used for quilting because of the amount of stitching you'll be doing, but in theory, any stitch that's normally used to make seams is fine. With running stitch, you can either do each stitch individually, going through the fabric completely, and then back up through the other side, or do each stitch in one go, going through and back up in one stitch. This is quicker, but there is the risk of not catching all the layers, and the thicker your layers are, the more chance of that happening. 
The same goes for loading the needle up with multiple stitches, except the risk is even higher. With machine stitching, it's even more important to base or pin everything together to start off with, as you won't be stopping and starting to rearrange the material, so everything will move too fast to keep track of it. You might want to place some pins in the pattern at key points as well, just be careful if you're doing that on a larger piece, make sure you keep track of where they are, and don't catch yourself on them or sew through them. And then it's just a case of following the lines on a straight stitch. For both techniques, you want to start on one side of the fabric and work outwards. Try and keep your pieces from shifting too much. That's where the pinning and tacking comes in handy and follow each line. If you're working on a grid pattern, do all the horizontal stripes and then rotate it and do all the vertical ones or vice versa. I have also started from the center and worked outwards with very center based patterns like Mandela's. You are likely to end up with some shifting. So as you reach the outside edges, you might need to undo your tacking or pins to stop the fabric from bunching up against it. Instead, allow whichever side wants to be longer to be longer than the other, and then trim it once all your sewing is done. And once it is done, either finish the edges with bias binding or combine them into your garment, and with that you're done. You don't want to try and do a double fold hem on something quilted, but if you're smart, you could leave the top longer than the bottom so it will fold over the bottom and can then be double folded. Just remember to account for your finishing technique when you pattern and cut out your pieces so you'll have enough fabric when you get to it. So that's quilting. There are a number of ways you can build on those basic skills once you've got them down. That 14th century bedspread that I showed you has extra padding stuffed in with the pattern to make it stand out more, for example. And the only real limit that you have is the pattern that you want to do and how much practice you have. The biggest tip I can give you for machine quilting is to check your tension beforehand. This is something you should be doing before every piece anyway, but I know I personally only do it when I'm doing something unusual. However, because this is in effect a decorative top stitch, you want your tension to be behaving and working at its best. And because of the combination of fabrics, the tension is normally something a little bit off from normal. Keeping some pieces of your project aside to do a test piece on will save you a lot of frustration later. And when hand sewing, I would say take advantage of the fact that it's so much easier to do flowy and curvy lines than it is by machine sewing. Yes, there are techniques to do these by machine, but they're a lot more advanced and you have complete freedom by hand. So why not take advantage of it? It will take longer, of course, but for small pieces, doing your quilting by hand will give you some really interesting results. Things like Mandela's can be very easily copied over to be used as a pattern for hand quilting. But as always with hand sewing, keep an eye on what you're doing and make sure that you're protecting your hands and not hurting your wrists. It is a lot of work after all. Whichever way you decide to sew, I don't recommend using Taylor's chalk to mark out your pattern. It has a nasty habit of disappearing if you handle your project a lot and you will be handling it a lot if you're quilting. I've said it before on various videos, but personally I use watercolored pencils after testing them out on a scrap piece of paper. But you can also get erasable pens and fancy chalk pencils and whatnot, so use whatever you feel most comfortable with. Everyone has their preference. I have also used the back of a project where I know that it's gonna get hidden or glued down before so that I can just go ahead and mark it in Sharpie. This obviously only works if you know that you're going to be covering the back of it, which is very unusual in quilting, but if you are, that is a very easy way to go forward. But with all that in mind, go forth and create something fantastic. Don't forget to check the description down below for additional resources and reading links, 
and I hope you have fun making something quilted in the future. Thank you for watching through to the end, and as always, a huge thank you to all of my lovely, lovely subscribers and all of my very generous coffee donators. If you enjoyed this or found it helpful, please think about giving me a like or subscribing if you're not already for more sewing and costume related content, or donating to my coffee if you're able. Stay safe, stay sensible, and I shall see you again soon. Bye. Today you are getting a proper headshot because it is too fucking hot and I don't want to wear clothes. But I have to because this is my lovely quilted waistcoat. Is a bed cover that shows the story of Tristan and is I've looked this up, I can do this. Is Isolde? Isolde.